welcome. Isn't it awesome that we can gather here together, worshiping God in this beautiful sacred space, surrounded by his holy presence. It's a beautiful day, and it's, it's particularly awesome when we can gather together at the Lord's table, sharing holy communion. It is a beautiful day. As we turn our hearts and minds to worship, let's stand together and sing our opening hymn, hymn 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to experience, for, for the sweet air, the sound of birds singing, for the activity all around us, for, for the people we can share the experience with. Father, thank you for this amazing sacred space, this, this space that's been bathed in prayer for so many years. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather here freely together, worshiping you. Thank you for each person choosing to worship you today. May we be bound together, joined as one with you through Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit, united as one spirit, bound through the truth that is your holy word. Please give us ears to hear your holy word, minds to understand your truth, and, and through understanding, the ability to apply it to our lives. Please give us voices to proclaim the good news of Christ Jesus to the world around us. Father, you've given us the, the gift of experiencing this day, and we know our purpose is to glorify you, to bring glory to your holy name and to Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Please help us. Help us to see the opportunities before us today to serve as your light, as your voice, as your disciples. 
we present ourselves to you now as, as your servants, bowing before you, asking, what can I do for you today? Please give us ears to hear, the words to say, the mind to know each proper step and the courage to act. Father, for that person suffering pain that never seems to stop, please take it away. Please give them your peace, your rest, your comfort, the gift of restful sleep. For that person waiting on test results, give them your holy assurance that you have the situation under control. For that person who grieves, wrap your loving arms around them and comfort them and, and let them truly experience your peace. Father, you know our needs. We know you do. We know you love us and, and you hear our prayers and you respond and, and your response is always perfect and always at the perfect time. Please help us see you more clearly, to hear your voice and, and know you as fully as our limited minds are able. We love you, we desire you, we praise your holy name. You are pure, you're divine, you're holy, you're all powerful, all knowing, you're sovereign. You have all authority in heaven and on earth. You spoke the heavens and earth into existence. You speak and chaos transforms to order. You created us and you breathed the breath of life into us and you offered your son, Christ Jesus, as the final atoning sacrifice the final sacrificial lamb for us. You offered him as our path to you. You offered him so that we might be cleansed in his blood. You offered him for our redemption and reconciliation and life. Through Christ Jesus, we have your light, your life and your love. We breathe you in. We receive your life. We receive your holy transforming grace. We receive you fully. May your glory be revealed here on earth through each of us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.
prayer printed in the bulletin. Loving God, we are thankful that you are our God. Accept our tithes and offerings as gifts of worship. Bless them so they may grow your kingdom in the hearts of others by faith. Amen. Jesus. 
A reading from the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, verses 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And all of God's people said, if you would uh, look again at the front panel of your worship bulletin, you will see our Lenten journey. Give up to grow. Last Sunday, I mean Sunday before last, talked about giving up control. Last Sunday, expectations. Next Sunday, we want to look at giving up enemies. And from the passage of scripture that Danielle has just read for us, we want to look at giving up superiority. Giving up superiority. A grocery store manager overhears a boy on the telephone at the entrance to the store. Now, we know how telephone conversations are. We usually hear only one side of the conversation. The boy talks and the store owner listens. Hello, sir, I am calling you to see if you can use a lawn boy to do your yard work. Oh, I see, you already have one. Well, is he doing your work to your satisfaction? He is. Thank you, sir. I am just checking. Then the boy hangs up the telephone. The grocery store manager looks at the boy and says, sorry, you did not get the job. And the boy says, oh, no, sir. I already got that job. I was just calling to check up on myself. You see, friends, attitude is everything. It is said that our attitude determines our altitude. In other words, we rise and fall by our attitude. Our attitude affects everything we do, how we treat one another, our relationship with God. Philippians 2 and 5 says, our attitude should be the same as that of Jesus. Our attitude, if we think about it, it reveals our spiritual growth. Thus the Lenten self-challenge of our pericope. Jesus speaks this parable to those so confident, overly confident in their own righteousness that they have an attitude of spiritual snobbery toward others. A parable, as you know, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. A simple story to illustrate a moral or spiritual attitude. So in this parable, Jesus juxtaposes an arrogant individual with an humble person. Jesus starts the parable. Two men, for our understanding, two men go to church to pray. Here's the picture. Two men go to church to pray. One is a self-righteous Pharisee. 
The other is an humble tax collector. This Pharisee thinks more of himself than he should. Now, the Pharisees are self-righteous, super-religious legalists who carefully obey the Torah, the Mosaic Law, the first five books of the Old Testament. They also follow the Mishnah that explains how to obey the Torah. There may be several chapters in the Mishnah devoted to one single verse in the Torah. They also follow the Talmud, a commentary on the Mishnah. In other words, the Pharisees, friends, these guys, they live by the letter of the book. They have a holier-than-thou attitude, and they separate themselves from people and practices that they consider unclean. In other words, the Pharisees obey the law for an outward show. Their motives are wrong. They want the praise of others. And you do know Galatians 1 and 10 says, if we want the praise of others, then we are not servants of God. When the Pharisees compare themselves with others, they always come out on top. Now, the tax collector has the right attitude. But to the community, a tax collector is the worst of the worst of Jews, the worst and worst of sinners, because tax collectors betray their people to the Roman government because they collect more taxes than what the people owe, and then they pocket the difference. So the Pharisee prays first. He stands before the altar. He raises his arms high, and then he looks up towards heaven, and he prays. Notice he addresses God, but he talks about himself. Mm. He thanks God not for all that he has, but for all that he is. And then he goes on to tell God how good he is. And friends, we dare not laugh at him because we laugh at ourselves. Listen to him in verse 11, and I want to read it from the message translation. Oh God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven forbid like this tax man. I fast twice a week and I tithe on all my income. Now, this Pharisee, he dots every religious I and crosses every theological Simply stated, he goes strictly by the book. He goes strictly by the book. He has a heart for religion, but his religion has no heart. He thinks his goodness somehow gains him brownie points with God. Now, the Old Testament requires a Jew to fast once a day once a year on the Day of Atonement. But notice, this Pharisee brags to God that he fasts 103 times a year, 102 times more than what the law requires. He even boasts that he ties everything he earns and buys. He blows his own horn as a double tither. You see, his heart is in the wrong place. And when the Pharisee ends his prayer show, the publican, this humble tax collector, prays. And I want to suggest that he has what I call good EQ. He has good EQ, emotional intelligence, self-awareness. He knows he is a sinner, so he stands at a distance. He does not walk to the front of the church. He finds an obscure corner in the sanctuary far away from the Pharisee. He does not even lift up his eyes to heaven because he's aware of his sin. 
He beats his chest to show his regret. Yes, we can identify with him. Listen to his simple but powerful prayer in verse 13, again from the message translation. God, give me mercy. Forgive me, a sinner. Friends, when we think that we are better than others, when we think we are better than others, then Jesus is talking to us in this parable. Listen how Jesus introduces the parable, and he tells us the reason. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Now, I want to do two things and be through. I, I, I want to notice the difference between this Pharisee and this tax collector. I want to look at both of them, and I'm finished. And when we look at both of them, the question becomes, Clinton, where do you see yourself? Where do we see ourselves in this parable? Now, what we see in the Pharisee is simply the overflow of his life. He loves himself. Nothing wrong with that. I love Clinton. I hope you love yourself. He loves himself. Nothing wrong with that. He thinks about himself. Mm, nothing wrong with that. He serves himself. Yeah, there's something wrong with that. And he even prays about himself. There's something wrong with that. Really, if we look at it, this Pharisee, he is his own God. He builds his self-worth self -worth on the moral and spiritual flaws of others. He consumes himself with religious arrogance. And I want to submit to you that his problem is he has a serious case of eye trouble. Look at verses 11 and 12. He uses the personal pronoun I seven times. And you do know the middle letter of the word sin is I. And the bigger the I, the greater the sin. You see, the I always boasts a false sense of superiority. Let's count them. Listen to his prayer, this self-righteous Pharisee. Let's count the eyes. I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else especially like that tax collector over there. For I never cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery, I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. At the end of the ninth service, someone shared with me this morning, and they were telling me about the sermon, and uh, wonderful sermon, then they said, I got a friend that's a Pharisee. And I looked at the person and I said, now, out of all due respect, there is some Pharisee in all of us. There is some Pharisee in all of us. You see, we often believe that we are the lead actors and everyone else secondary characters at best. Have you ever noticed how we get bent out of shape when we do not get our way? We think everything revolves around us and a person all wrapped up in self is a small package. Self-righteousness is self-esteem at the expense of others. How sad. The Pharisee puts his trust in himself rather than God. In other words, he makes God irrelevant. And truth be told, we often impress ourselves with ourselves. A young pastor boasts in public that all the time that he needs to prepare his Sunday sermon is the few minutes it takes him to walk to the church from the parsonage 
next door. And after a few weeks of hearing his sermons, the church buys a new parsonage five miles away. A person all wrapped up in self makes for a small package. That's the reason I like the way the hymnist puts it. Have thy own way, Lord. Have thy own way. Hold over my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Get Clinton out of the way till all shall see Christ only always living in me. I, you, I'm just an instrument. I'm just a vehicle, just a tool. Thank God that God uses. But I don't want you to see Clinton. I want you to see Christ only always living in me. And then finally, the tax collector. What we see in this tax collector is humility. He has no reason for arrogance. He has no good deeds to tip God's imaginary scales. His prayer is barely audible. Yeah, it doesn't sound like much. No fancy words. No pious chest beating. No artificial religious preservative. Just honest prayer from a sinner. That's me. And I hope you are my cohorts. Just honest prayer from a sinner. This ta tax collector recognizes the sin in his life and his need for God's grace. Now, the Pharisee, I, I, we did the seven personal pronouns, I, a few minutes ago. But look at the tax collector. His seven word prayer drips with humility. He uses I only once, and then it is have mercy on me. He, he speaks of himself as the object of mercy, not the subject of every sentence. How often when we pray, we inform God about ourselves? That's another sermon. Just an honest prayer of forgiveness from a sinner. Seven words, prayer. And he simply says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. This tax collector comes to the place of prayer to focus on God. His outburst is a genuine cry for mercy. He comes empty handed, ready for any crumb that falls from the master table. I want to submit to you, he has the right attitude. How do we come before God? How do we come before God? Friends, we must come with the right attitude. Because all of us, because all, 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 all of us are sinners. All of us are sinners. So we have to come with the right attitude. We're not better than others. None of us can throw stones because all of us live in glass houses. Simply put, all of us are sinners. Some years ago, I got a telephone call from a very dear friend. And with a voice that trembles in anxiety and regret, my friend wants to meet to talk with, with me about something. And as we try to eat lunch together, tears soak, tears saturate my friend's eyes. But my friend needs to talk. And I just listen. My friend begins to talk. And I just listen. My friend talks some more. And I just listen. Then my friend tells me about a sin that gnaws away at them and robs them of peace. My friend wants prayer. My friend wants forgiveness. And my friend wants me not to be upset with them. And when my friend finishes their cathartic moment, my response 
is simple. And we sang it a few moments ago. That third verse I love so dearly. Oh, to grace, how great a debt. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. God hears my heart. Oh, take and seal it for your courts above. And Paul says in Romans 3.23, fall of sin and come short of the glory of God. The final thing, Jesus begins this parable with a good guy and a bad guy. And by the time we get to the end of the parable in verse 14, notice what has happened. The good guy becomes the bad guy and the bad guy becomes the good guy. Let me put it like this. The Pharisee leaves church a sinner and the sinner, the tax collector, leaves church a saint. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 14. This sinner, not the Pharisee, return home forgiven. For the proud shall be humbled and the humble shall be honored. So friends, how do we leave church? How do we leave prayer? How do we leave worship? You know, our attitude reveals the landscape of our heart. It is said that a bad attitude it's like a flat tire. If we don't change it, we'll never go anywhere. Listen to the, spir the spiritual, spiritual, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, not the preacher, not the deacon, not my father, not my mother, not the stranger, not my neighbor. But it's me, it's Clinton, oh God, that's standing in the need of prayer. Shortly, in a few moments, we're going to come to the Lord's open table to eat the bread and drink from the cup as we remember what Jesus did for us on old rugged cross, as we remember that we are all sinners, as we remember this holy mystery, this sacrament, is God's confirmation to us that God forgives our sins. Don't you hear the hymn writer? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood and lose all their guilty stains. And Jesus did it, and Jesus continues to do it, not for us who feel superior to others, but for all of us sinners. The Lord's open table reminds us that we are all equal. We're all the same. We're all sinners, and that none of us are better than others, and all of us need the grace of God, God's gift to us. Pastor and author Max Licato says, grace is God's best idea. Grace. To get what we do not deserve. Grace. God's favor to the unworthy. Grace. God's unconditional love to the unlovely. Grace. God's unconditional forgiveness to sinners. And that is us. Grace, the peace of God to the restless. Grace, the unmerited favor of God. Grace, God himself. Grace, friends, we cannot achieve it. Grace, we cannot buy it. Grace, we cannot earn it. Grace, we can only receive it. God wants to give grace to us, but we have to receive it. And may our prayer be, let us humble ourselves and receive God's gift of grace.
And all of God's people said, Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> Please be seated. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
you'd like to make a decision to follow Christ, become a part of our church family, or to pray at the altar, we invite you to come while we stand and sing our closing hymn, 357, Just As I Am Without One Plea. God's gift of grace to us, God's gift of God himself. May we receive that gift of God's grace, and as we receive it, let's share it with others. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.